Um, but to start off, I want to uh, talk about the database that um, has been developed uh, in Berkeley, uh, which has been uh, spearheaded by Todd DeSantis, and uh, uh, of course Phil Hugenholtz being very important in this too, our Green Genes database, which is the basis for uh, all the uh, subsequent work we do with the phylochip. chip. And so this is a very comprehensive 16S database uh, that we, we developed because there was nothing else like this that existed. Basically with very high quality sequence uh, uh, where Chimera checked and where the phylogeny was based on full length sequences. And so um, it's, this is what we use for um, designing our phyla chip. Um, the, the first step in, in uh, our phyla chip then of course is to cluster all of these high quality sequences uh, into common and into each, each cluster which were common by n MERS, usually seven MERS. And so these, these common clusters are our basis for our probe sets. So um, the problem in taxonomy and in, in uh, bacterial taxonomy these days is that it's definitely in flux. And so there's a number of different uh, nomenclatures, different taxonomies out there. And at first this may seem like just uh, trivial problem of splitting hairs uh, for a very, very minor session, but actually it has, a, uh, it's very important in, in all of our microbial work that we do, especially uh, when you want to compare one study to another. So I just, I highlighted one example here, and in this case, uh, just looking at one o organism, this uh, Hal anaerobium species here, which by a couple of different taxonomies is placed in, in uh, a diff in its own, um, phylum and order, whereas in uh, RDP and others, it's a, it's a, fir, a, fir, a firmicutes uh, clostridia. Uh, uh, so if you were, if you were um, comparing at higher levels of phy phylogenetic taxa, you would uh, have troubles comparing from system to system. And so I'll, I'll be returning to this later in the talk that taxonomy is actually very important. And so uh, it's, it's something to, uh, even though for instance in our phyla chip, we are not interested in, um, in, er, in actually uh, our sequence exactly mat matching a specific taxonomy. Uh, we want to make sure that it can compare uh, from one study to another. So uh, recently with the uh, NIH uh, human microbiome, we became the uh, center for storing all of the uh, 16S biomarker data. And so one of the advantages of doing this is that something that uh, we've always wanted to do is have more, uh, more control on the quality of the sequences that come in. And so normally when a sequence comes in, uh, it, it comes in just as a FASTA file. But what you really want to know is just what is, how accurate are each one of those bases. So now when we uh, import uh, sequences, we also make sure we, we know the FRED score. So in this uh, just uh, example here, we have uh, a few bases in a row with a very low, uh, with a, a six FRED score. And so any future work in which was using that for a discriminatory probe, primer, whatever, um, you, you would take that with a grain of salt knowing the, uh, the low uh, FRED score there. So um, we have developed a phyla chip. So uh, as I started to say before, it, was, um, it starts with looking at clusters of common sequences. And then so we designed probes, uh, 25 base probes for each one of these clusters. Uh, in our uh, uh, generation two, we've had 24 probe pairs on average for each of the probe sets. And by doing this, then we can identify multiple taxes simultaneously. Uh, and so, so this, rather than um, looking at each uh, sequence in serial, in, we do a massive in parallel. We look at everything at once and we can identify simultaneously the organisms there. So in our generation two, we have um, about 9,000 different uh, clusters that we looked at, each with a probe set. And we've gone up with our generation three to over 30,000 um, uh, probe sets uh, for clusters. So we look for, um, uh, to get as minimal uh, cross hybridization as possible. Uh, obviously, uh, that's, that's a goal rather than something we always achieve. But we look for, uh, for instance, to make sure that not only does, is the whole 25 base unique, but the central 17 mer is as well to increase the um, uh, probability of, of a specific uh, interaction. 
So the actual processing, I'm not going to really spend any time because uh, is, this is just old technology, unlike all the exciting technologies you've heard. Um, uh, but I, I will say what's what we do though is the, the important steps to remember is our, we start with extracting the total DNA. That's, that's a very critical step. And uh, we either extract the DNA or with a file chip we can also look at ribosomal RNA, which, is, which can be uh, very important for uh, looking at activity as well as uh, uh, composition. Um, and after that it's treated pretty much just, the only thing that's, that's unique about it is that it's fragmented and labeled with biotin and hybridized to the phylochip. So um, we use an affymetric system and that's because we need really high density. And so um, we, our generation two is 500,000. We've gone up to over a million probes that we use uh, on, our, on our phylochip. And um, by having, what, what uh, gives us the increased confidence is we have multiple probes. Uh, to increase our confidence of detection. And then within, for each of those multiple probes, we have a mismatch control probe uh, to minimize cross-hybridization. So those two factors working together uh, greatly increases our confidence that what we're detecting uh, could potentially be real or is real um, and gives us, gives us more confidence that way. And so by placing the entire amplified product onto the uh, phyla chip, we're able to um, see low abundance organisms as well. We, we can typically see down to one ten thousandth of the dominant member, so that gives us a very wide dynamic range. Um, so we can indeed catch the, the rare members. I won't really have time to get into this, but where that really comes into play is if you have a highly dominated system. If, you, if you're sequencing a highly dominated system, you're getting the same read over and over again, and it's, it's, you rarely get the, the, uh, the rare members of the uh, of your biosphere, and so uh, a microarray is a better approach in that case. So doing all this together, then we can identify, the whole point of this then is to identify multiple species in a mixed po population for our uh, high resolution microbial analysis. So uh, this is just to give an example of how the, the chip was designed then. So, so this would be based, this would be a, a sequence cluster, in this case three sequences of disulfo vibrio clustered together uh, with common sequence. Looking for things which were common amongst them but which were as much as possible unique from everything else on a number of different 25 base probes uh, here schematically shown here were identified. Then in a sample what we see is um, in this case uh, uh, for these 20 different probes, the perfect match probe was in each case uh, statistically and significantly higher than the mismatch probe, indicating um, uh, more of a, uh, of a uh, nucle nucleotide specific interaction, and it was above a background. So what we, we say if an organism is present, if the signal is 500 times on average greater than background, and if uh, at this level, if the positive fraction is somehow is 90% or 92% minimum of all these probes are, are uh, positive. So um, this is just an example of the output. Um, I'm not gonna talk about this particular example, just to give you flavor of the output though. This is a, uh, uranium a bioremediation study, a column experiment uh, that was done by Owen Brody with, um, with Mary Firestone. And this looking at uh, uh, a contaminated sediment from Oak Ridge, uh, uranium contamination uh, for prior to stimulation with a carbon source and then a, a couple time points after. And what we see here is that this is prior to stimulation and a couple points after on a heat plot map here showing how different uh, uh, taxa or probe sets uh, uh, acted and clustered together. Um, we, uh, what, what Owen and, and Mary Firestone did was um, they were able to use replicates and so 
Um, that was one of the advantages here. So and that's what in these studies I'll show in the follow. Um, one thing that's important is not just to look at a snapshot, but to look at multiple points in time and then to have something where you can do statistics so you have replicates. That's also very important. And so in this particular case, uh, they saw a group of organisms that clustered together that before stimulation were low in, in abundance and then after were much higher, and uh, including these, uh, these uh, anaerobic geobacter organisms. They, they uh, then went back to confirm with both family-specific and species-specific uh, qPCR and, and indeed did uh, verify that those were there, which, which was uh, biologically relevant. So with this phylochip, we can start to answer some very fundamental questions. And so a graduate student down on, camp, on at Berkeley campus, uh, Eric uh, Dubinsky along with uh, uh, Mary Firestone, again, uh, asked this very fundamental question of what environmental factors determine the composition and structure of soil microbial communities? Uh, what drives these uh, communities and their structure? And so what they did was they looked at six different uh, types of soil communities in a gradient from uh, from uh, drier, uh, from grasslands, mixed conifers in California, all the way to rainforest, uh, different different um, types of rainforest in Puerto Rico and look to see how the, the soil structure uh, was um, uh, correlated with environmental uh, parameters. And so to do this study, uh, replicates once again were done. So in this case, three uh, different 10 meter transects were used and for each one of these transects, five uh, 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 a core sample five different uh, composite uh, core samples were taken uh, and mixed to look at, uh, at for one measurement. And so we measured different um, uh, environmental factors and then compared this with a phylochip. So one of the first striking things that was found was that um, as, well, what was kind of more expected was that this, these were very, uh, all very rich uh, in species uh, soils and so uh, of the, this was our generation two and of the, of the around approximate 9,000 different terminal taxa, we, in at least one phylochip, um, uh, there was up to 3,000 different uh, terminal taxa detected from 49 phyla. And what, what was somewhat interesting was that uh, from uh, different, each of the different types of uh, systems had relatively the same bacterial richness. So they had approximately the same number of bacterial species that were present from one place to the other here, uh, from, the, from the drier grasslands uh, to, to the redwoods to the mixed conifer up to the, the rainforest here. So it, it was not, not different amongst the ecosystems. Now, uh, archaea were different. Um, on the microarray, uh, and we did see an increase as we went into the rainforest of, of more archaea uh, in the different uh, ecosystems. And this is probably not surprising considering we're, we're looking at the first 10 centimeters of soil, and in the rainforest you can actually get into, uh, or quite often do get into anaerobic conditions um, in the first 10 centimeters, and so there's very likely many more archaea that would be present. So then what Eric did was uh, to do a community structure uh, by, uh, uh, by ordination. And so he used a multivariate ordination called non-parametric uh, multi-dimensional multi scaling. And he just, and he looked at the, taking all the complex different uh, points from each of the uh, uh, microarray data points and just uh, put them into a, an ordination and saw where they, they, they fit. And, uh, each community, uh, community, as it turned out, was very distinctive from each other one. Uh, so, and nearly all the, the uh, variation was explained in two dimensions. But what's really amazing here is that one dimension ex explains 90% of all the variation of all this complex data uh, amongst all these places. Uh, just, just one dimension. So looking at actually what are the drivers in this one dimension in, uh, that, are, that are different from place to place, uh, what was found that is that moisture by far and, and things related to moisture, mean, mean annual precipitation, uh, mean annual temperature, uh, were uh, very highly correlated uh, um, 
with uh, changes in community structure. And so then um, looking at individual community members, uh, so different probe sets, uh, in this case looking at, uh, this is geo, a Geobacter species uh, over the different uh, communities uh, just based on the uh, moisture content and it had a positive relationship with soil moisture. And um, this, in thinking of this, so Geobacter is a dissimilatory iron reducer and uh, is, is more active in uh, when oxygen is depleted. Uh, so that, that makes uh, some sense. Th this was a Streptomyces, uh, an, an actinomycete, and it decreased with increasing soil moisture. This is a spore-forming organism, uh, very common in soil. So uh, taking a look at all different um, uh, taxa, different probe sets uh, for all the different places, uh, what Eric found was that over 50% of the taxa were either positively or negatively correlated to soil moisture. And so here you see negative correlation is, is gold, uh, positive is blue. And so most of the negative correlation was in the first uh, few uh, uh, phylum or subphylum here, the, the, as the actino, or the actinobacteria here, the bacilli, um, and some of the proteobacteria. So this was confirmed then with uh, qPCR, and indeed we saw that those results followed exactly uh, like before. So the actinobacteria were reduced with soil moisture, the, uh, and uh, these uh, uh, metal reducers, methanogens, increased with soil moisture. So then uh, uh, what was done next was to take a look at what was the phylogenetic distribution of the organisms which were positively correlated and with soil moisture. These would be the blue and negatively correlated. These would be the orange. And as it turns out, it was a very non-random distribution around this phylogenetic. Uh, this is the a phylogenetic uh, profile of the whole uh, bacterial 16S tree. And keying in on the areas which were dry adapted, the dry taxa, see that they fell in just a few areas um, here. The, in the uh, bacil bacillus, the actinomycetes, the sphingomonas, uh, pseudomonas, um, just uh, very few limited places, whereas the, the wet adapted were uh, in many different places. And um, the other difference is that uh, phylogenetic is that um, uh, wet adapted taxa seem to derive from other wet adapted taxa and vice versa for, for dry. And also um, these dry adapted taxa seem to have evolved more recently in geological time. So taking all this, um, uh, there was, as you remember in the beginning, uh, there, was, uh, there was no increase in actual richness but as it turns out, there's a very large increase in diversity of, of phylogenetic diversity of organisms between the wet, wetter soils in the rainforest and the drier soils, uh, such as the grasslands. And um, so uh, Eric looked at what was the reason for this and has developed a model based on uh, spatial segregation. And basically, it's just saying that uh, if organisms are not in contact with each other, you can have many more associations, like an allop uh, allopatric speciation, or just like an island effect. Uh, you're not competing with your very closely related neighbor. Uh, if, you, if you're in a saturated soil, you're in much greater competition, and uh, you have so a much greater diversity because of that. So um, just uh, going on to another example here, um, We've also looked uh, for a, a NASA project that we're looking at um, uh, for planetary protection. In this case, we're working with uh, Mitch Sogan at, at uh, Woods Hole. We're also working with, with uh, Venkat Venkatasawaran uh, down at Jet Propulsion Laboratory. And we're looking to see what organisms are on spacecraft. Um, and the goal here is because you don't want to forward contaminate places where you're looking to see if there's life. You want to know what you're bringing with you. And so these, these spacecraft that we look at are very low 
amounts of biomass on there. They have very few organisms. They're very hard to detect. But so we want to know what is the uh, composition of these organisms. And so we've looked with our uh, file chip, and, and Mitch has also looked with 454 sequencing. Now, um, because these are so low abundant, what uh, Mitch has to do is pre-amplify by doing a full length uh, 16S amplification like we do. And then from the pre-amplification, he then does the internal uh, uh, variable region amplification. And so what we compared in this one study was our, we had to go up to 35 cycles of PCR amplification with Mitch doing anywhere from no pre-amplification up to 35 cycles of, of pre-amplification. And what we, what we saw was that uh, as um, we increased from, from no preamplification to, uh, to 35 cycles, we decreased the number of unique families detected. Uh, so we started much richer, and then we, we decreased at, at the uh, higher uh, PCR cycles. It's not too surprising. This has always been thought uh, to happen. But when we pool these together, we got uh, a similar number of families detected by the, from the four different 454 runs uh, than we d that we did with our file chips, uh, 140 families to 142 families. So very close relationship and no number of families. We were interested in how closely these families were to each other, and they were actually remarkably close. So most of the families that were detected by the file chip, when you put all four uh, uh, 454 runs together were very similar, uh, but there were some which were detected by either the method that, that weren't by the other, indicating, of course, that uh, the complementary nature of these uh, techniques. Uh, one, one caveat in doing this, though, is that this is using our green genes taxonomy. If the normal way that's, that's done for uh, 454 sequencing with, with short reads is to go uh, and, and base it on, um, on transitive reads. So if base it on the sequence of, an, of another short um, uh, sequence, finally to a long sequence, whereas we just look totally at the long sequence. So um, that does give you a diff different discrimination. So um, uh, we have developed a uh, a new version of this file chip. It's, um, we've just finished the validation of it. And so, as I said before, it's up to 1.1 million probes. Uh, it's based on a reference database in the green genes of 320,000 320, uh, full-length chimera-checked uh, uh, non-redundant sequences. Um, we've decreased the size, so there's no increase in chip costs. It's about $150 per chip. Uh, we've had some new uh, analysis algorithms that we can do with it. Oops. And so this is, this is what we're starting to do with Generation 3 file chip for analysis. Uh, we're, we're looking at, um, at, at more of a probability-based function where each probe, if, if the greens indicated uh, unique probes where it didn't share with another organism, uh, this would be a very high probability if all these were positive that came from this one organism. Uh, these red indicate that they would share with another organism. And if some of those did, um, then we'd have a mid-confidence level. And if more, um, if there were some other organisms that had uh, probes which, which were in, in uh, which were in common with, with the organism we're interested um, and we're pretty confident that they were there, that would give us a much lower confidence because it could be one or the other. There could be cross-hybridization there. So it's an iterative approach here where we're now looking at a probability value uh, based on the, the value of uh, probability of each uh, probe um, uh, being uh, potential, potentially unique for that particular organism. So. Um, one last thing here is that we've done a, um, uh, a, a Latin square analysis here where we're basically looking to see the responsiveness at probes. And so this would just be a schematic of how it would look like uh, looking at um, if we had, in this case, we have four different organisms, four different concentration. So on each chip, we put each one of the four organisms at one of the four different concentrations. And then each organism has a different concentration on each chip in a different background. 
And so we did this in a 26 by 26 Latin square and with three replicates. And we had from very, uh, very um, diverse organisms up to uh, methanogens or, or up to um, uh, archaea as well, down to very closely related, uh, just different uh, closely related species. And we looked at, at uh, different target concentrations. And we were very uh, pleased with, with how responsive the probes were in the backgrounds. So we had a response at around um, up to about 0.8 picomoles right around here, um, which equals about 0.1 nanogram. And it was, it was quite a, um, a linear response on this log-log scale here um, as we increased intensity. Uh, so the R squared values for both these were, were around 0.95. So there, there was a couple cases where uh, we had some values which were way off. In this case right here, we had a number of probes which should have, should have been down low but were, were high for their, um, for, for their predicted picomole value. And this was from Dechloromonas aromatica, and, but there's Dechloromonas uh, agitata has cross-hybridizing probes, we knew that, um, on this chip. And when you add the two together, uh, you, you can see that this cross hybridization is totally uh, responsible for for the um, for the response, and and so when you put them together, the curve the curve fits at a greater than uh, than 0.9 r squared. So and um, I only have time for one slide here on the uh, our mica chip that we're developing. So uh, we're still developing this, so that's why I don't have much to say. Um, uh, this is, we're using the same approach we've been using for the phyla chip. Uh, we're looking at the uh, ITS region in the first uh, uh, part of the uh, large subunit, the D1, D2 region, doing the same thing that we did with 16S in the um, uh, phyla chip. And we're looking at the same way at sequence polymorphisms to base uh, identification. And what we can do with this, we hope, is look at very fine resolution again in uh, environments. And this may help uh, direct, for instance, metagenome sequencing projects when they move on to fungi. So, um, and I, I won't go to those other parts of that. Just in the end, I just want to uh, thank uh, uh, people in the lab who've, who've been helpful. And um, uh, any questions?